We just finished up with the farewell address. And really quickly, our signs were for George Washington's bye-bye speech to the nation. Stay away from Europe. Those war gods, they fight every Wednesday. The isolationist policies, sometimes will go like this around us. This is isolationism. Remember foreign policy thesis, we only do things to protect our self-interest. This is the 98-pound weakling concept, right? When you're 98 pounds, you don't go tell the football player that his girlfriend's ugly. That's a bad idea. Wait till you're 140 pounds, maybe 180 pounds. Nevertheless, stay the hell away from Europe. Then we point to the ground and we say, watch out for the two-party system. Remember that Washington had a um, bipartisan cabinet, meaning that he had Democrat-Republicans, Jefferson, as his Secretary of State, and Hamilton, the Schwarzenegger dude, um, as Secretary of Treasury. So he is really fearful that as he steps down, that the country is going to kind of devolve or evolve into a mess that's partisan. That it's only about my party, it's not about what's best for the country. And in fact, he's, he's kind of right. And then the last one, which is blah, 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 no more than two terms. Remember the concept that Washington, while he could have served more terms, stepped down, saying that we really didn't want to have this type of system where somebody was president for 16, 20, 30, 40 years. So this becomes part of the unwritten Constitution because every president after George Washington until FDR is going to step down if they get to their, through their second term um, because they don't think they're better than G. Do you think you're better than G? Well, FDR did, and he ran four times in one. After his death at the end of World War II in 1945, we amend the Constitution, and we, will, we write what was once unwritten written, the 22nd Amendment. That's why this works out so good, right? Two, two, no two terms. And again, ba -ba 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 bump I'm checking my machine. It's still recording. ba 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 bump two thirds of both houses, three fourths of all states. If you say that enough, you'll remember it. That's one of the main processes that we use to change the Constitution. Again, federalism. Two-thirds of both houses, that's the federal government, three-fourths of all states, the children, yay. And that's the concept, all right, 22nd Amendment. Let's move on really quick, and we're going to uh, move on to Adams and kind of go in order. John Adams is the second American president, and he is a hardcore federalist man. You know, Washington's a Federalist, but, you know, he had Jefferson in his cabinet, and I think that he's, you know, kind of bipartisan in a sense. But, um, he believes in strength and whiskey rebellion and, you know, supremacy and elastic and all that stuff, but, um, you know, he's kind of cool like that. Adams, not as cool. Um, and one of the laws that he proposes to Congress, which does eventually get passed, is called the Alien Sedition Act. This is probably the only thing that you need to know for John Adams, the second American president. And the Alien Sedition Act was really a partisan law, a law that was meant to help Federalists. And really, that's not a good idea if you're passing laws just to keep yourself in power. The alien part does not refer to little green men, but rather immigrants. And basically what the Federalists did was they set quotas on the amount of immigrants that could come in from countries like France, anti-Fed countries, revolutionary kind of countries. So really, in the eyes of the anti-Feds, the Democratic Republicans, the Jeffersonians, they see this as, you know, you're abusing your power. And second is sedition, which made it a crime to speak out against the government if what you said was proven untrue. And that would put a humongous dent in freedom of speech and press. If you knew that if you said something later down the road, somebody proved you were wrong and you could be arrested or you could be fined. Um, this was a law designed to shut up the, the, the uh, you know, um, people that were against Adams, the opponents. There's probably a better word. But nevertheless, there is a reaction. All right. I, I want you to understand what the law means and basically how it's a pro-federalist law, but the reaction is really a, a concept that's going to move on and get us into a civil war eventually. And that's what the South responds with. They can't respond with a federal law, they don't control Congress, so they respond with a resolution. I resolve, like I believe, and it's called the Kentucky-Virginia Resolutions. And the Kentucky-Virginia Resolutions, really a Jeffersonian kind of document, said we're not going to listen to the Alien Sedition Act. We're not going to enforce that. What are you going to do about it? And the concept is nullification. Remember the joke in class? I say, do most of you, most of the time, listen to your parents? And most of you, most of the time, grudgingly go, yeah, okay. And I said, well, if your parent, you know, who you listen to said, Johnny, you're going to school naked today. Take your clothes off. You'd say, uh, I don't think so. 
And that's the idea of nullification. When you think that the rule or the law or whatever you're supposed to do is so unethical or so against, you know, righteousness, natural rights, that you refuse to do it, you are nullifying it. And later down the road, this is what's going to lead us into the Civil War. Can the states in this relationship of federalism nullify federal law? Can the children say no to the daddy? And if they can, when and how much and what do you do when they do it? And there's lots of questions. But I do want you to understand that concept of Kentucky-Virginia resolutions as a response to the Alien Sedition Act. I'm checking my time. Good for us. All right, the election of 1800. Adams is our first one-timer. Um, he, he ran for his second term in 1800, and um, basically, I don't want to get too much into the election of 1800 other than to say it's called the Revolution of 1800, and this is why. Um, it teaches us a couple things. One thing is the electoral process. I don't know if on video I've ever gone over that, but remember, it ain't the guy with the most votes that wins the presidency. It's electorally divided, meaning that every state has a magic number, and that number is based on that state's population. Every 10 years in the census we count state's population and that number plus two, the two senators, that's what that represents, equals your electoral number. So as population shifts occur, different regions of the country get you know more power, but basically you have to um, earn a majority, 51 percent, of those electoral votes. And if you have a lot of people running and you chop up that electoral vote, nobody wins the presidency. It goes to the House of Representatives. This only happened once in our history. Because of the two-party system, you know, we always have two people split it and one guy gets more than the other guy. Um, sometimes they don't win the popular vote. Al Gore, 1877, Tilden Hayes, Grover Cleveland, maybe. It happens. But in 1800, nobody got the magic number. So the election got thrown into the House and Jefferson was chosen. He was chosen because there was probably more Democratic Republicans in the House. But nevertheless, there's no civil war. There's no bloodshed. There's no dead bodies. It's a peaceful revolution, but for the first time in American history, we have a transfer of political power. The other side won, and nobody got shot doing it. One of the other concepts for um, the uh, administration of Jefferson is the concept of the Louisiana Purchase. So we're just going to go over this really quick because I only have a couple minutes. And this will teach you kind of the beginning roots of uh, Manifest Destiny and um, something about the Constitution, hopefully. Um, sometimes in class, and Mr. Hughes is going to get a little bit silly here as he looks around for some type of prop to use. Um, I got one. I'll be right back. Thomas Jefferson loves his baby. I get paid for this either way, guys, so bear with me. And he holds his baby tightly. And the baby, in this analogy, and I'm going to hold the stupid thing tightly, represents the Constitution. Remember that Jefferson was an anti-Fed. Jefferson loves the Constitution in a way where he holds it tightly. He reads it strictly. If it's in there, you can do it. If it's not, you can't. He doesn't want to loosen, you know, um, control over the Constitution and have the federal government grow. He wants to control the federal government through the Constitution until he meets Napoleon. Mr. Jefferson, I have a deal for you. The Louisiana Purchase, I will double the size of the United States. I don't know what accent this is, by the way. Um, I will give you Mississippi River. You will have all the grain that your people can eat. I will sell it for you dirt cheap. Let me check my baby. And the concept, of course, here is that Jefferson is a strict interpretationalist. He has to check the Constitution. Eventually, as I run out of time on YouTube, I love my baby. Idea, loose interpretation, that Jefferson, in order to get the Louisiana Purchase, had to do something he wasn't supposed to do, sign a treaty. There's no Senate. He uses his power. He does it. He expands the role of the federal government, something that he used to say was a bad idea. But Louisiana Purchase, yeah, Mississippi River, it's on the test doubles the size of the United States, it's on the test. And really, you know, the other idea is the grain, that we have a, a belly for America to grow. So Louisiana Purchase is an important idea, loose, strict interpretation. And, you know, the Federalists are dead now. Um, they, they never regain power. And in fact, um, not on the test, but in the uh, War of 1812, they kind of have an embarrassing incident where they're caught kind of dealing with the British in a positive way at the end of the war, Hartford Convention or something. 
man, there's a lot of things in my head that don't make sense. Um, and nevertheless, the party breaks up. They eventually turn into the Whigs, and the Whigs will become the Republicans through the Free Soil Party. It's a complicated thing, but uh, Republicans, watch out. That's where you are right now. It's a dangerous situation. See you guys.